So Amal Tritcher Kabesh is uh, an associate professor at the University of Nottingham. She taught at other universities before uh, moving on to Nottingham. She teaches in the School of uh, Sociology and Social Policy. So she doesn't come uh, from the area of literature, and she'll talk about this herself. Um, her research in recent years has co concentrated on, uh, on the relationship between Egypt and the UK citizenship, gender, and subjectivity. Um, her books are Postcolonial Masculinities, Emotions, Histories, and Ethics, and her most recent book is Egyptian uh, Revolutions, just out actually, uh, Conflict, Repetition, and Identification, and she'll be talking about that tomorrow evening at 6. So, on to you. Okay. Um, I am really, really not a literary theorist. So if you want to talk by a literary theorist, uh, I'm not your person because I come at novels and autobiographies really as a cultural studies theorist, okay? So, but I'll explain to you why I find novels especially useful in terms of the kind of work that I do. So what I'm preoccupied with, both my specialist, my specialist areas really is Egypt and the UK, but the UK is sort of as an, almost as an aside to Egypt. But what I really want to try and do is to explicate, to draw out what I think of as the underbelly of societies, that which is negative, that which is difficult, and especially that which is silenced and not spoken about. So classically, you would think, well, I should do interviews. Well, there are a number of reasons why I don't do interviews. One of which is that Egypt, like every other society, people will tell you the official discourse and won't actually tell you what they really think and feel. So that's one reason. And I'll explain more why I think novels actually do that much more. But secondly, and as important, I don't trust myself. Right, and what do I mean by that? It's right, so I'm not gonna start stealing your wallets or anything like that, but what I don't trust myself to do is, <laughs> is to, um, is actually to really prize yeah. apart and really to get at uh, people's narratives. So I think, you know, I tend to be rather protective of people and I am especially vulnerable to actually, um, this is a terrible admission by a feminist, but actually to protect men, right? So when I come across male vulnerability, I can be, I'm useless. There's no point pretending otherwise. So don't speak to me if Roger Federer loses tennis because, you know, I'm just absolutely hopeless. So it's one thing talking about Roger Federer. I don't do work on tennis, but I do do work on subjectivities itself. So what I tend to need is distance from an actual live human person in front of me. So, you, so that's why novels enable me to have some of, that, some of that distance so that I can do the critical work that is required if you're going to get to actually what I think of as the underbelly, the underpinnings of a society. So, but in any case, doing research is always, always about, and I'm sure you found that yourselves, actually when you were doing your dissertations, is always a relationship between proximity and distance. Too much pro pro proximity, and in a way you need it, you need that immersion, yeah? You need that immersion to kind of really sink into it and really in a way to inhabit what is going on. On the other hand, you also need the distance or some distance, in, well, more than some distance, in order to gain an analytic and more theoretical foothold on what is happening. 
Now, you know, we can talk about balance. We're rather over fond, in my experience, of talking about balance. It, because it, and why, what do I mean by over fond? I think it never quite works. So, you, you know, so at times you have to be absolutely immersed and in other times you have to absolutely and utterly stand back and think through, uh, yeah, from a much more distance angle. So that's why, as a cultural theorist, I use novels. Because uh, one of the things I am much more interested in are, is the emotions and fantasies that actually underpin political life or indeed political events. I don't think political events are, as it were, rational. We would hope that our politicians are rational. Though listening to your Prime Minister yesterday, who was so emotive, if ever you needed an example, actually there you've got it. You've got it in Malta from yesterday, where your Prime Minister was absolutely and utterly emotive. I can't speak Maltese, so, you know, I'm useless here. But, you know, I could tell from the tone of voice, I could tell from the crowd's reaction. Just so happened my hotel room overlooked the square, so I was <laughs> first-hand witness to all of this with absolutely no distance, it has to be said, except, of course, the distance of language. But in any case, actually, that was a prime example of the emotionality, the affect underpinning supposed political rational discourse. So that's the kind of stuff I want to get at. I want to get at what is the real glue that holds together a society. So actually, you know, Egypt is a society with a long history of colonization and a long history actually where it's denied. It's not, of course, no one can deny that the British were there before them, the French before them, the Ottoman Empire, and, you know, we go back 500 years. No one can deny that. But what the denial goes, it's over, right? It's over with, it's in the past. A kind of continual mantra in Egyptian narratives goes, forget it, right? So what I want to understand is, what does it mean, this continual repetition, of forget it, what does it mean in terms of everyday living, everyday people, and simultaneously I also want to get at the continuing effect of colonization, because Egypt is a long, long way off actually from becoming a society that's effective, a society that is based on anything like social justice. Not the only society in the universe like that, unfortunately, but that's the society I'm kind of engaged with. So what I'm about, really, is trying to find out the non-coherent, okay, the kind of unlivable bits, actually, of our lives. You know, what drives us sometimes to want to rest, or indeed what drives you, you know, to kind of carry on going until May 27th and beyond when you have to do your final exams. So what is it that drives us in terms of our, our lived experience and what is it that actually, frankly, just exhausts us? So that's my attempt to get at that, to get at those that which is elusive, I think that's the best word, and that which is slippery, and also that which is silenced, is to try and do this through, through, through novels. It's my only way in. So really, I am engaged in that which is troubling and troublesome. So I think both constitutionally as a person, I'm not very impressed with positive emotions. I have no, I don't know if it's the same. In the UK, we're full of stuff around happiness. Is, is, has that reached you here in Malta? Thank your God. Because it's a nightmare. It's, it's, you know, we've all got, got to be happy 24 hours a day and, you know, we've got to be satisfied and our lives have got to be full of meaning. I find that exhausting and so on and so forth, right? So really, you know, I would encourage you to keep that particular happiness discourse, happiness demand outside of the door. So the emotions I'm interested in are much more 
those negative emotions, those of disappointment, of frustration, of exhaustion, which is more a state of mind. We can talk, if you like, about the difference between emotions and states of mind. So that is what I'm about. And so I will, at some point in this talk, uh, give you some illustrations from uh, Egyptian novels. So really, as much as I am about trying to get hold of that which is elusive and that which is slippery, these things are never abstract. Because actually, official discourses official, if you like, family narratives, actually we inhabit them, we internalize them. That's the problem with them. The problem with them isn't actually that we're, um, that they're just official. We internalize these discourses. If you like, we become these discourses and we certainly become the narratives of, of, um, uh, of, of, fam of, of the families that we were brought up in. So, do I care that my work is seen sometimes by some people as subjective? No, not really. I, I don't, because I do think that there are too many false dichotomies in, in actually academia, one of which is a kind of dichotomy around that which is objective and that which is actually subjective. So, I think all academic work, should I say this thing they're about to take their finals, it's too late, I've started. <laughs> you know, I think all academic work is really undershot actually by emotions, by fantasies, by kind of actually subjective belief systems. But to repeat the point, you need to know that in order to get some distance from it. You can't just sort of say, that's what I think, yeah, that's the end of the story. This is what I think. Why is then the question, right? Why do I think this? Where is it troubling that I think this or feel this? Yeah. So you can't hear me actually is also upholding emotions as the truth. I think emotions are as formed by discourses and as narratives actually as anything else that we have. You know, there is a tendency to talk about emotions. Do you know, it's a kind of Oprah Winfrey take on emotions, isn't it? Somehow as emotions as the truth. Well, they are as formed, actually, through the sociopolitical as anything else. But of course, also, emotions get in the way. So especially in my first, my first book on post-colonial masculinities, I was completely haunted continually by my father. Right, and my father was the kind of figure on my shoulder. Do you know those figures on your shoulders that don't shut up, that kind of go away in your ear, yeah? Like, are you really thinking that? You know that one? Are you really going to write that? Yeah, you know. So he was the person that most haunted me as I was trying to write the book. And, and to go back really to the beginning of what I was trying to say, actually one of the things that actually is an anxiety, and it's especially an anxiety if you come from the Middle East and yet you work in a Western academic context, is that kind of anxiety about betrayal, right? And seeing I am about the negative, that's even worse. I don't actually provide a narrative that everything is great. So as, long as, as well as being haunted by my dad, um, I'm also haunted by what I think of actually following a couple of theorists, Avery Gordon in Ghostly Matters, actually what she calls the thing. And the thing is actually she picks up from Toni Morrison. I'm, you've come across Toni Morrison, some of you come across Toni Morrison, the American uh, novelist, some of, most of you haven't, okay. But in any case, Toni Morrison, is, is a black female writer and she talks about the thing. And the thing is that which you cannot get hold of, right? You know, you know that, you know, if you kind of lose the soap in the bath, you, do you know what I mean? You kind of can't find it, but you know it's there. Yeah, it's that, that the thing, the thing, yeah? So I am about, if you like, the thing. Now, Freud, 
to bring in psychoanalysis here, Freud was actually all too troubled actually about the way that that or who haunts us, actually that which kind of preoccupies us is actually all too real. So for Freud, these are not just spectres of our imagination, they have a material and historical reality. So, so now, so this is really what I try and do. So I try and think through, actually, if you like, the thing. How do we understand the persistence, the absolutely enduring persistence of colonization? So is it, as in a way, Fanon's uh, depiction? Who's come across Fanon? Any of you come across Fanon? No? Okay, all right. Fanon um, from Martinique was a, a psychiatrist who then worked in Algeria. And actually, he was, in a way, actually the father of post-colonial studies. So for Fanon, you know, there's always a problem, there's always a difficulty in overcoming the traces and the wounds of history. So there's Fanon, and he's all about that which is fixed, if you like, that which is stuck. And alongside that, you've got more current post-colonial theorists like Hami Baba, who you certainly won't. If you've not heard of Fanon, you won't have heard of Baba, and we can all live with that. Don't bother reading Baba, he's impossible. Mm -hmm. But actually, he's much more about that which is productive and that which moves. So how do we understand the past and actually... Or let me put that question another way. There's then the question about that which continues and that which has changed. And that is always a persistent question, right? You can never say it's the past, as it were, forget it, right? But also you can't, you can't also say that everything has changed. In the same way, you can't say that the past and the present are precisely as one. So how do we then understand the variety of emotions that actually are expressed and represented in literature. So emotions such as loss, anger, disappointment, love indeed, anxiety, hope, those kind of, if you like, slightly more positive emotions alongside those where I started the list, which is much more the negative emotions about loss and anger disappointment, if you like, also helplessness. I think it's very difficult, especially in terms of neoliberal subjectivity, to recognise how helpless we can feel and indeed how helpless we can be. Do you know what I mean by neoliberal subjectivity? Any of you? No? You haven't? No? Okay. In short, Neoliberal subjectivity is about being positive, is about kind of believing that you have choice, yeah? is about actually always being an autonomous human being, right? So it's not about, so it's about actually, um, and always making sure you're never past your sell by date, yeah? So you're always up to date, you're always modern, you're always making choice, you're always kind of know yourself, know the other, know where you are, and there is no such thing as doubt or indeed, how can I put this, uh, doubt or ambivalence or actually a kind of, you know what, I got up and I came to work and I had a normal, ordinary, slightly boring day, which I haven't so far. That's not my day, but I'm sort of saying that kind of stuff isn't allowed. So I want to come back to a point I was making because I really want to, if you get nothing else from this talk, then this is really, I think, incredibly important. And I pick this up from a theorist called Ben Anderson. And what Ben Anderson talks about is the question of atmospheres, socio-political atmospheres. So rather like Freud, and I have no idea if Ben Anderson's a Freudian or not, what he talks about is about atmospheres as real phenomenon. 
Okay, so they kind of, they envelop us as individuals and they envelop societies. Now, they're not necessarily, and this is his language, sensible phenomenon, right? But atmospheres, are they form us, they form what we think, they form the socio-political discourses. And so they're around us, they're alongside us, they're shot through us, but atmospheres are key. And atmospheres, as we all know, actually can be enigmatic. So how do we then begin to think through a society and how a society is formed through that which you cannot pen down? So I do think that novels express and articulate actually the underbelly, I'm sorry to use that word again, it's clearly my word of the day, forgive me, but the kind of underpinnings which actually are frequently made absent. So how do we then understand, if you like, the vulnerability of masculinity when actually a lot of official discourses, a lot of official injunctions for men is for them to use a very common expression in the UK at the moment is to man up. Have you come across manning up? Okay, well, man up, Adrian, man up, right? Okay, be decisive, be rational, right? Okay, you know, don't talk about feeling hurt, yeah? Don't talk about your vulnerability. Don't talk about actually, you know, I'm, I do, I'm picking on Adrian because I know him, that actually, you know, you had a zeft, to use an Arabic, were a horrible day at work, you know, it's actually, it's always about how you overcame the obstacles. So there are these, it's interesting that it's not around in Malta, these are very around in the, in the UK at, at the moment. So I actually heard my next door neighbor tell her four-year-old son to man up, <laughs> right? At which point you think, really? He's four, right? <laughs> and it's the same in Egypt, right? In Egypt, it's all, it's all about bravery. It's all about the, uh, you know, the rational patriarch but I'm going to talk about patriarchy in a moment, okay? So novels, I think, kind of hint at, they gesture to that which can be unspeakable and that which, can, which uh, people in terms, uh, in terms of their societies have difficulty recognising or indeed knowing. So it's about trying, trying to pull out pull out that which haunts us and that which actually is silenced and uh, made so absent. So I'm going to talk with you about some examples. I want to just illustrate this through some, uh, some examples from some Egyptian novels. So in Egypt, there is much, much resistance to thinking about the enduring effects of colonization. As I said to you earlier, the continual repetition is forget it. And I can't tell you, I would be exceptionally rich if I had one euro for every time I heard forget it. I would almost end my day actually as an exceptionally rich woman. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, okay. The Egyptian joke is that what we're run by is what we call uh, BMI. BMI, B is Bukra meaning tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I is inshallah meaning God willing, right? So there's a lot of stuff around fate, right? And the third one is Ma'alesh, which means uh, don't worry about it. Actually, it, it, the original meaning of Ma'alesh has completely changed over time. But actually, so this is a society of tomorrow, God willing, and don't worry about it. And, you know, you again, right, I would hear this a lot. So there's a contradiction, though, in Egypt, because as much as a colonized past is res resisted, it's ignored, it's rendered absent, there is, especially at the moment, an idealization with, th with the past. Yes, so actually it's then very, very difficult for us to talk about actually 
uh, how our husbands, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, men we love, men we know, actually have been compliant, at best compliant, if not complicit with colonial relations, right? So um, there are some beginning novels. Uh, in a strange sort of way, Mahfouz's The Cairo Trilogy is a novel that comes close to that. And actually, um, as um, Aswani as well comes close to that, really in his novel, uh, The Jacobean Building and Chicago. I'll speak more. So it's all about actually how, in a way, the past is both idealized, there's a kind of odd nostalgia around the past, but at the same time, there's a pretense that nothing had happened, right? There's a pretense that actually, um, you know, going back across many generations, that there's been no damage and no injury. Is everybody okay? I can't quite work out what's going on. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, and so, if you like, they. Can I just add, once, once you've stopped, um, that sort of our literature has completely ignored, well, not completely ignored colonization. But there's very little about the colonial period, the, the British colonial period in our literature. Interesting. And this is something which we haven't really dealt with um, in. Uh, in our in our narrative of Maltese literature, like for example, we we, we did a, a novel together last year, which is Under Three Rains, and basically it's about Tatlet mm -hmm. and it's basically about water under the the nights, and then the very brief period under the French, and then the beginning of the British period, and then it cuts, and then it ends. Yeah, it ends with mm. the British flag. This is you know the this is the uh, what the quintessential. Maltese in the um, nationalistic novel, and it ends with How a British flag yeah. flying over the protagonist's house. And so the protagonist is Maltese. And the protagonist, all protagonists are uh, Maltese. Maltese. And another thing that my that we will all remember is that sort of my insistence on the fact that you know the the Arabs in the novel don't even have a name. <laughs> well, there's a first. And, and, the, and the British character is Mrs. Flemington, Flemington throughout. Mrs. Flemington. She's the only one who's referred to with her title. Yeah, and so therefore with respect and status. Yes. So, so what you're saying... It's interesting, it's a woman, isn't it? Yes. And of course, um, uh, the, 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 the novelist who was for 30 years or more the... the, the the head of department of our department of Maltese, a linguist. Um, he <laughs> describes her as very beautiful mm. because she has white skin. Mm. So, you know, this Fanon mm. all, all, all over again, mm. I thought. Mm. We did mention Fanon, by the way, last year when we were in the I believe context, you, actually. just. <laughs> yeah. Black skin, white skin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, well, so this, this issue of, of whether we talk about our British colonial past is. I think something we really need to take up. Sorry, that. No, no, I th well, I think that's really interesting. So let me just kind of riff a bit on that. So there's a reluctance then of all societies that have been colonized, I think, to think about their colonial past, because I think it does raise so many issues around compliance, around complicity. And let's face it, would we be any different if we lived in that time? You know what? No, we wouldn't. Yeah, all of us would do what we can to survive. Then there's the continuing idealization, actually, of whiteness. In Egypt, actually, you go into any pharmacy and you can buy skin bleaching products really, really cheaply. And I mean really, really cheaply. So my stepmother, actually, let's not talk very much about my stepmother, let's just move away from that bit of family history, but my stepmother said about my sister, so my sister has children, my brother has children, and she said about my sister-in-law, she said, well, she managed to produce white children, what's the matter with your sister? Right, so, so there are different things then around beauty, around who has status, how we gain status, 
Right, but I think what Adrian is really helpfully put, uh, pointing us to is the direction of that which is made absent. So what does it mean that it's the British flag that flies over the protagonist's house? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of mind-boggling, really. So one of the things in Egypt, and I don't know if it's the same in Malta, you know, you're going to have to put me right about this. So one of the things in Egypt, one of the ways that colonization is denied is through this injunction to be brave. So there are lots of references to how apparently the Egyptian army is mentioned in the Quran, therefore it's true, as the most brave army, uh, you know, ever. So this is read off, not just as the time when the Quran was written centuries ago, but that it's an enduring fact that actually the Egyptian army is the best and the bravest in the world. So there are then many, many, there's a, there's a lot of talk around bravery. So let me give you an example. There's a novel called The Open Door and Layla, it's an, a novel written by a woman and it's about a young adolescent coming into adulthood female. But her brother, Mahmoud, is wounded in a fight against the British soldiers. Now, everyone assumes, this is typical, that this is because Mahmoud was brave and Layla goes off to school and for one glorious day, she's the heroine of the school as everybody's talking with her about her brave hero of a brother. She gets back from this kind of glorious, exalted day, and she finds her brother with his back turned. He's in his room. He's lying there silently. And she says again that he was brave. Now, this is what's then. So we have the discourse of bravery. But then this is where I think the novel does something different because he tries to tell her that he was a coward. So there we have a gesture to male vulnerability, right? and kind of male uh, disappointment, if you like. But actually, she cannot hear it. So then we're back into, actually, if you like, the discourse of, you are brave. So he, she keeps asserting, but it was you, it was you who attacked the British. He capitulates and says, yes, it was, yes, it was. But as the reader, we know it wasn't. So I think what I'm trying to get there at there is that novels can reveal that which cannot be tolerated. They speak another truth and, if you like, reflect the struggle for wounded and besieged identities. So in probably the most famous three novels, the Cairo Trilogy, written by Mahfouz, who uh, won the Nobel Prize, first and only Arab author to do so, actually he tries in that book to very much draw out uh, um, actually not the past but the impact of colonization on Egypt, on, on Egypt as an imagined community. So what he tries to get at there and to, uh, how can I put this, resist is what I think of as the national amnesia in terms of colonization itself. So these novels can draw out, I think that's what I'm trying to get at, the wounds and the injuries that actually we all suffer. You know, none of us have coherent identities, yet we all have wounds and injuries. You know, we have to learn to live with them, actually. You know, we have to learn with to live with actually the damage, actually, damaged creatures that we are. But of course, the damage to colonization is something else as well. So, actually, I want to slightly shift, actually, and talk about a book written by Gillian Slover. I think it's very interesting, Gillian Slovo, a South African writer, uh, but actually now lives in the UK. She wrote a book recently called An Honorable Man. And The Honorable Man is actually about the dreadful events of the British in Sudan and other colonized countries. But actually, it is about the effect, actually, of being a colonizer on the male protagonist. It also, by the way, traces through the effects on his wife and her growing addiction to opium. So we can see this as damage every which way. So 
Now, similarly, and I know we're not meant to talk about this, but I'm going to, in Adolf Swayze's novel, Map of Love, an English widow describes the slow, painful withdrawal of her husband, who also had been in Sudan himself. And actually, he ends up dying. It's a, suicide, a passive kind of suicide. And he says, I have no wish, I have no strength. So again, the novels are about drawing out and, and more than drawing out, and I'm sorry about the repetition, male vulnerability, if you like, male weakness. There's probably no more weak statement of, I have no wish, I have no strength. So it's about, some novels are about trying to trace through the slow, the deliberate demise, actually, of men. So one of these things, and this is where my relationship to Egypt and the UK comes into play, one of the things I'm interested in is the damage which is done both to the colonizer and the colonized. Now, I'm relieved to hear that at least you've had a mention of Fanon, because one of the things in post-colonial theory, Fanon's classic text, one of them is The Wretched of the Earth, a very passionate, angry text, it's referred to continually in post-colonial literature, but I've rarely come across his case studies, which are at the end. Nobody ever really talks about them. He was a psychiatrist, and you know, at the end of The Wretched of the Earth, there's a series of painful, painful case studies actually about the damage that has been done by colonialism. Actually, by the way, they've discovered uh, his plays. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, he was a playwright. I discovered this just last week, and they uh, discovered this, this guy has really spent 15 years unearthing his work, and it's coming out Bloomsbury 2017. I'll send you the reference. So, anyway, I thought this was really for Adrian, actually, so that bit. You can see him going on Amazon as soon as we leave the room, eh? <laughs> So again, in the novel Chicago, and this time by an Egyptian novelist, Alal Aswani, this essential male protagonist is haunted by his lack of bravery. And actually, again, we witness his demise. So alongside all of that, we then, novels can also point to the demise of the patriarch in Egypt. So to go back to the Cairo trilogy, which, if any of you have got the energy, I would suggest after you finish your exams, June, whatever, that you settle down on a lovely Maltese beach with a beer and read these three novels, right? It's a family saga across three generations, and it's really about a middle-class family. So the central role, actually, in this trilogy is the mother, is Amina. And actually, she is the unsung heroine of the family, despite the ostensible authority of the father. So she's the one who holds it all together. The trilogy starts and ends with her death. So she is actually, as it were, the bookends that holds the trilogy together. She sets the pace. She actually controls the pace and the space of the narrative. Now, beneath that, what we have is the layer of patriarchal control. But actually, there's another layer that continually subverts this. So the central male character, Ahmed, Ahmed El Said, starts off as authoritarian, as virile. But actually, as the trilogy goes on, you absolutely see him becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. So it is worth knowing that actually that most famous well-known Arab patriarch, for those of you immersed in Arab literature, which I'm the only one in this room who is, is actually, he's the most well-known Arab patriarch, but he's also the one that represents the fragility of patriarchy. The fragility of patriarchy is never spoken about explicitly in Egypt. There is still a phenomenal pretense, even amongst the younger generation, that actually patriarchy exists. Well, of course, patriarchy does exist, but it's nowhere near, thank goodness, as strong as it was. 
So while my father used to joke that the man is the head of the family, he then used to go on to say, but the woman is the neck and the shoulders that moves it, you know, these jokes reveal, yeah, jokes reveal that which is also going on. So there are different relationships to patriarchy and actually that which is kept hidden. I have four adult stepchildren, two step daughters, two stepsons. The eldest is actually, so it goes um, man, woman, man, woman. And the eldest actually, I've just said, is male. Now, you know, he pretends he's the patriarchy. We all go along with it, but we all really know who really controls the family. We're all terrified of her, actually, is my youngest stepdaughter, right? No, she is. There was an incident recently where her dad kind of said to me, he said to me, will you tell her? And I'm going, I'm not telling her. You tell her. And he's going, no, 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 no. And so we're kind of shoving it around the family, around who was going to tell her that she wasn't going to get the money she wanted. That was it, what it was all about. We all kind of, in the end, I think, it was me, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But actually, the point is, we also know, actually, the two most powerful people in that family are actually my two stepdaughters, yeah. They're the ones who, who talk to one another. My younger stepdaughter would never go to her eldest brother for advice, yeah. But the pretense, so that's what's going on, but the pretense is something else. So novels enable us a route into thinking this through, right? So actually, in a way, the Cairo trilogy and, you know, reading the demise of Ahmed El Said, you know, you, you begin to think, or I began to think through, actually, about what is the actual power in the men in my family. Right. What actual power do they actually hold? How is it subverted? And actually, how is it not? As well, quite critically. So actually, when sorry to keep going on about family politics, but actually, when my eldest stepdaughter wanted a divorce, it, she's got one, but she got one because her dad actually came in as the male patriarch and sorted it out for her. Right. It's what she wanted. Right. So it's a kind of complicated relationship at that moment. She wanted it, she drove it, and she got it because of her father, the patriarch, right? But there are other injunctions, of course, which novels and memoirs also break. Big injunction in Egypt is actually that you're forever loyal to your parents. So Edward Said, in his memoir, Out of Place, is incredibly critical of his father. I mean, almost quite staggeringly so, actually. But this comes out, actually, if you like, in the kind of subversive narrative, uh, you know, in terms of being critical of his dad. Whether he could have written that when his dad was alive, of course, is another conversation. So in some ways, Edward Said breaks. You have come across Edward Said, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so in some ways, Said breaks a kind of very common injunction about loyalty to the parents, but then in terms of his absolute idealization of his mother, he then actually upholds another injunction. But I want to actually speak with you a bit also about the question of desire. So actually, you know, <laughs> There's a lot of denial of um, sexual activity in Egypt. And by that, I mean sexual activity in terms of homosexuality. Loads of denial, actually, about lesbian homosexuality is rather dismissed as they call it playing, which is rather contemptuous and dismissive. And there's certainly a lot of denial, actually, of... of um, of the amount of uh, sexual activity that takes place outside of marriage. We all know that the most popular operation is actually the sewing up of the hymen, so we all can pretend virginity still exists. You can't prove it. Please don't ask me for social science evidence. I can't give it to you. 
but we all know it. And I mean, we know it because we know it, not because, yeah, but you can't get at those kind of figures. Now, these novels, especially novels written by women, actually talk about uh, female desire and not female, female desire as our desire as female subjects, not our desire as objects for men. That's a crucial difference. Yeah, are you with me? So, you know, our desire as desiring beings, right? Not that we should be desirable for the male gaze. So, actually, you know, in Map of Love by Adaf Swaif, Adaf Swaif's also book, uh, In the Eye of the Sun, is replete with uh, instances of female desire. Uh, Shema, interestingly enough, Shema is a very, very classic. Uh, almost religious name, actually in the no novel uh, Chicago has explicit sex before marriage, or she also explicitly masturbates. So there's a lot of that in, in the novels themselves, actually about female desire. And not just that, but female desire that is actually, und uh, is what's the word I'm looking for? Well, it's acted upon. It's not just, you know, the women just don't go, oh, yeah, I fancy him, you know, full stop. It's actually uh, active. It's full of emotion. It's full of fantasy. It's absolutely full of stuff. There's nothing vanilla sex about those novels and actually what these women in these novels are about. A classic novel, which I've already mentioned, The Open Door, where Layla is the central female uh, protagonist. She's absolutely and utterly about her growing maturity into a sexual self. So in the last few minutes, I want to just introduce you to uh, a new range of feminist writing in, in Egypt. Um, the best novel I think out of this genre uh, that's been translated into English is called uh, Blue Aubergine. Uh, what do you call aubergine here? Do you call it aubergine? We call it betangan. Okay, all right. Okay, well in Arabic it's betangan, but anyway in the English uh, translation it's blue, it's blue uh, Arabic, um, blue, blue aubergine. Now this new strand of feminist writings is absolutely anti-establishment so it's radical but it also disrupts it also disrupts binaries which the west especially is very fond of of the secular versus islamic um, of the modern versus the traditional of uh, the secular as that which is successful and the religious as that which is traditional and failed so what these new feminist writers are trying to do is to actually promote hybridity and it's very important for them to actually represent many voices and especially to represent the many voices of women uh, ourselves. So actually what they do is they try and find a different way of writing, a different way of rendering into the present that which has been most kind of silenced. So these novels are not about, they're not romantic by any stretch of the imagination because they are absolutely preoccupied with conveying and exploring and representing complexity. And so the women's voices are at absolutely intertwined. Interestingly enough, if we go back to the notion of the neoliberal subject, they're not about the sole author, if you like. They're not about the sole narrator, but they are about trying to draw out the many different voices and the many different conflicts that women have. So their presence is actually as characters in their own right. And so, you know, these novels are about, and I'm sorry if I keep repeating this, trying to draw out that which has normally been silenced, but also absolutely and utterly about trying to convey the complexity 
of lived experience and the complexities of what it means to be a human being. So on that note, that's why I find novels and autobiographies far more fruitful than, if you like, the traditional social science way of interviewing people. So that's my little offering for you for today, but I wonder what questions you've got or what comments. We've already had Adrian drawing out an absolutely beautiful analogy, actually, between Malta and Egypt. So I wonder what other thoughts that you've got about Malta. You don't have to just engage with Egypt. What are your thoughts? Was anything interesting in this? Or you don't have to say yes just to... What are your thoughts, questions, comments, perceptions? How are women represented in Maltese literature? And what do female authors do with, with femininity? They must do something, surely. Please tell me that not all Maltese literature is just written by men about men. Well, anyone? Can you see any analogies? This this is a uh, this is an issue we've been we've been dealing with uh, the, the fact that women are absent. From oh, you they are absent. We are absent. Women are absent from what is literature. There are very few women writers, and Why? when men write about women, they are um, they are very much uh, stereotypical figures, flat figures. Oh. But there are students here who have worked on, on more recent literature written by women, which is extremely engaging, which deals with uh, sexu female sexual desire, um, and which I think is overtly contesting uh, the narrative that Maltese, um, that Maltese literature has... Uh, brought across practically ever since it's, it's the beginning in, in the mid-19th century. But it's only recently that these very strong, important female voices are coming out. So how does that leave you feeling? Thinking frustrated, disappointed, or same old, same old? What is the threat then, do you think, in terms of Malta, if women begin to find their voices more? Because it is a threat, yeah? It is a threat. Let's not, you know, you can't go into any bookshop without being surrounded by novels by Mahfouz. Well, you know, Mahfouz died. I mean, I don't mean that horribly, but he was 91 when he died. You know, he was an important author, but of his time. You struggle to find these other authors. So there's a question also about who's marketed, yeah? who's available. Can, can I, I, because I, I don't think there's the time and perhaps, uh, yeah, there's probably not the time for, for, for us to engage more fully with you on this. But I have to say, and I don't think I've ever said it to, to, to the group, that I feel that there is a that there is a certain unease with not only f women writing, but even but especially with feminist writing, because the impression even students have is that uh, feminist writing is sort of one-track-minded. It's limited. Whilst what your your argument. 
um, especially in the second part of the lecture, was that you know um, this kind of uh, writing is actually exploring complexity, to use mm. the term, mm. all the time. Mm. So somebody like Claire Azzopardi would be would be sort of seen by some people, even in academia, even amongst my colleagues, as somebody who's sort of fixated on a particular perspective. Whilst I, I, would, I would rather agree with you that this kind of writing actually opens up our literature to the complexities which are completely ignored in, much of our main, in most of our mainstream literature. I think I also want to say that I think it's not important that we, it's Im as important that we draw out the complexities of male identity as well as female identity. And I think that's the best that we can offer. Because I think it's as flat to continually write of men as strong and as rational and to bypass the other aspects of male identity. Yeah. So. So I think that's the best of feminist work, actually, which is about, yeah, complexity itself. I wish you loads and loads of luck in the next... When do your exams finish? I know it's in June. <laughs> I know that. So they start May 27th. When do they finish? The 13th of June. Take your multivits for those two weeks, eh? I think on the 20th, we have the you have your Viva. Oh, you have Vivas? <laughs> Loads of luck. <laughs> I wish you well, seriously. Okay. <laughs>